Redditors who have been kidnapped. What was the experience like and are there things you would do now that you wouldn't do before? Story 1. When I was 14, I was walking around the mall where my parents worked before it opened, and I was headed to my favorite store so I could be there as soon as they raised the gate. The store was in a relatively quiet part of the mall and right next to a stairwell that is rarely used, but I always went because it was the shortest path between my parents' store and this one. On my way down the stairs, I saw a guy standing in the corner on the bottom level next to an employees-only corridor that led to the rear entrances to stores and eventually outside. I paid him no mind, but as soon as I got to the bottom of the stairs, he was suddenly right next to me. He touched my arm and said, I don't mean to seem weird, but you're absolutely gorgeous. I said a polite thank you and started to walk away. I guess he wasn't finished with the conversation because he then grabbed my arm and stopped me in my tracks and asked my age. I was really uncomfortable but decided to be polite in hopes that he'd go away eventually. I told him I was 14 and he said, no way, I would have guessed 18. I had a sense of relief when he said that because I naively thought that he would become disinterested now that he knew my real age. Wrong again. He proceeds to tell me that he has a small kiosk that sells purses and asks if I want to follow him to the back corridor to see his back stock. I said, no thank you, I'm just headed to browse some clothes. As I turned to go, he grabbed my arm again, this time violently, and began dragging me toward the corridor. I screamed, but since this was a sparsely populated corner of the mall, it took people a few seconds to realize where the scream was coming from and what was happening. He put his hand over my mouth to shush me, and I instinctively dropped to the floor and became dead weight. This got his hand off of my mouth long enough for me to scream bloody murder and for a couple of mall employees to run out and see him dragging me. When he saw them, he let go and ran off into the corridor. The police came, statements were taken, security footage combed, etc. They never found him. He was not an employee, did not own a kiosk, but had been seen on security footage for a month or so prior, presumably casing the mall. I was very lucky to get away. To this day, I deal with PTSD and I can't walk anywhere alone, not even to my car in my driveway. That was 15 years ago and it messed me up big time. Story 2 a few years ago, I was in Prague with a couple of my friends. We were backpacking across Eastern Europe, and Prague was the second stop. It had been a long train ride in from Amsterdam, so we went out to start celebrating quite early. I, in particular, probably went a little too hard, too fast. By 10 p.m., I was quite drunk, and the constant smoking amplified my feels for the day. There were also a few shots of absinthe that were taken. There is always a debate whether they make you hallucinate or not but there is no debate that they make you plastered drunk. The next few parts of the night are still a blur, but somehow I left my friends and found myself walking around on the street outside the bar we had been in. Something happened, rather I probably did something, that started an altercation of sorts with a random stranger. We were able to mesh it quite peacefully, but not after some loud noises and causing quite a scene. I decided to walk away to kind of just get away from the area in case any trouble arrived. I was walking down a quiet side alley that I remember from earlier in the day that led to my hotel when an unmarked white van creeped past me. Now, mind you, my friends and I had idiotically just watched all two of the hostile movies before we had left for Europe, so that whole kidnapping thing was still fresh in my mind. I started walking faster and faster, almost came to a running pace when I thought I was just overreacting and that the van was long gone. Less than a few seconds later, I hear brakes screeching behind me and turned to see three large guys running towards me and the same white van parked right behind them. They grabbed me and threw me inside the van before I even knew what was up. I was completely scared at this point and tried to reason with the four guys in the van, but they didn't speak a lick of English, or at least didn't respond to my pleas. We drove a few blocks until we came to a stoplight, and I decided that this was my last chance to make a break for it or else I was completely screwed. I dove over one of the guys sitting next to me and straight out the van door that I somehow managed to open fairly quickly. I got maybe half a block before the guy caught up to me and tackled me. I looked around and tried to scream to any onlookers to help, but of course there was no one around to be seen. They handcuffed me in the van the rest of the way. We got to some building, very old, and the hallways we walked in looked old and dilapidated. I was still freaking out too much to think sanely or get any real bearing of the place. They tried talking to me for a bit, but I couldn't make out the few English words they said to me, so they took me to a prison cell-esque room and started tying me down on a bed. There was blood on the headrest of this bed, and this was the moment I started realizing that something really bad was going to happen to me from that point on. 
They left to go do something for a few minutes, and in those few minutes it was life or death time for me. Still to this day, I look back at those few minutes and really admire myself and what I tried to do. You always think that when you are in a life or death situation, you will fight to survive any which way you can, but you don't really know until you are actually in one. I started trying to take off the straps immediately. There were two on my wrists and two around my ankles. I kicked and wiggled and did everything that was humanly possible to get out of those leather shackles. I was able to get off the two feet shackles within a few minutes and started focusing everything I had on my wrists. I have never fought harder to do anything in my entire life. I was fully convinced that in a few minutes, I would be dead if I didn't get this done right at this moment. Somehow I was able to get the shackles off my wrists while skinning them in the process. I had blood pouring out of cuts from both my wrists and ankles, but I was free of them. I went over to the window and punched right through it, but to my utter dismay, there were bars right behind it. There was nothing I could do. I was completely trapped with no chance of escape. My captors heard the commotion and came running into the room. They grabbed me and tied me down to the bed again, and this time put one strap over my chest, leaving me effectively unable to wiggle or move. This was it. I was freaking done for. In the next few moments, I made peace with death for the first time in my life. A beautiful wave of peace washed through my entire body and I laid in my bed feeling completely okay with the world. I thought about my parents and my friends and hoped that they would at least learn of my death and not be left wondering what happened to me. I thought about my dog and hoped that she wouldn't think I just abandoned her. I thought about quite a few things, but all with a peaceful heart. An hour, or what felt like an hour, passed and no one came. I thought for sure they would have began skinning me alive by this point, or whatever sick torture device they would have chosen for me. This was also around the time I started getting sober and that damn absinthe started leaving my mind. A few things I had previously been oblivious to started coming into focus. This place I was in wasn't as dilapidated and abandoned as I had previously thought. I could hear noises of people coming from down the hallway, and it reminded me of a public place, not a dilapidated kill house that I had convinced myself I was in. The street outside my now broken window also seemed quite alive. It was around this time that two of my captors decided to come into my room again, and I started realizing that they weren't going to kill me. They came into my room wearing raggedy-looking lab coats, but on these coats were also name tags. The next few minutes, everything started making a little sense. They gave me a breathalyzer, cleaned up my cuts, and bandaged them. Afterwards, they took me out to a waiting room with quite a few people in it, gave me my clothes back as well as a nice ticket for public intoxication and a hefty bill for my stay. A couple things I've learned from my first stay in a Prague prison and hospital. I'm never drinking absinthe ever again. I'm never watching messed up movies that scare the crap out of me before a vacation. And that I'm pretty sure that if and when I am in an actual life and death situation, I will have the will to fight for my survival. That was my most screwed up night ever and the strongest instance of fear I have ever felt. Story 3. I could still remember every detail. When I was six years old, my mom got into a road accident and my grandmother, who was with my mom, got severely injured. So my grandfather, alongside my aunt and uncle, rushed to the hospital, leaving my two younger siblings and I with our female babysitter at home. My family trusted her, so they didn't think that there would be a problem. Our babysitter's boyfriend came and it was the first time I ever saw him. My babysitter started helping him carry some of our expensive home appliances into his van, which made me really confused. My babysitter then told me that we were going to visit the hospital and I was a bit reluctant. Why the heck would we visit a hospital with our home appliances? When we went outside, I caught our neighbor's maid looking at us and she was on the telephone panicking. The boyfriend started dragging me into the vehicle and he was so harsh that I started screaming and kicking because it was too painful. My siblings started crying as well. Luckily, the other neighbors heard us and went outside. Some men attacked the boyfriend. My grandfather arrived and saw the commotion. He got so angry that he gave the boyfriend a black eye. The police came and declared that it was an attempted kidnapping, and a few days later, it was revealed that they were active human traffickers. My family never hired another babysitter. It wasn't too traumatic for me, but I started doubting every visitor that comes to our house, even if it's a relative. Story 4 when I was seven, we went camping in our brand new camper, so we were super excited. When we arrived at the campsite in South Dakota, we unpacked everything from the back of our truck into the camper. I unpacked some of my Barbies and decided to go play at the rusty playground with my sister. 
It was getting dark, and we ran back to the camper with our Barbies, and I dropped one without realizing it. When we got back to the camper, I saw that I dropped my favorite Barbie, so I ran back to try and find it. This guy was standing at the place where I lost the Barbie and acted all nice and gave it back to me, proceeding to say that his daughter had some Barbies that she didn't want. So my seven-year-old self followed him to his car and said he was going to drive back to his tent. I got in and he drove a couple of blocks until I realized what was happening. I started screaming and he stopped, and I jumped out as fast as I could while screaming. He drove off, leaving a huge rubber trail in the road. I sat on the side of the road until my parents noticed I was gone, and they eventually found me crying on the side of the road about four blocks away. Story 5 I'm not sure if it counts as kidnapping since it was my own idiot fault, but I did get held against my will. When I was younger, I was kind of a latchkey kid. My parents always worked and I generally didn't see them until 8 or 9 in the evening, which meant I was always lonely and had a ton of time after school to myself. There weren't really any other kids in my neighborhood, so I was desperate for people to talk to a lot of the time. Anyways, I started going on MySpace when I was about 13, and I would get all kinds of weird guys adding me and talking to me, and typically if they were way older or ugly weirdos, I would promptly tell them to screw off. However, one guy started chatting with me that was male model gorgeous. As a bonus, I felt even more safe because I had heard of this guy before. He had formerly been a track and football star from my local high school, and he was kind of legendary. He was 21 and I was 14 when we started chatting and I was swooning. Why would this gorgeous guy take an interest in boring young me? Anyways, he invited me to a party one Friday night right when summer break had started and I was ecstatic. Partying with older kids? Actually having something to do on Friday night while my parents were working double shifts and generally not giving a crap about me? Yes, please. He picked me up in a badass sports car, which further impressed young me and took me to this dingy little party house a few towns over. One of his friends was rich, and his parents owned a lot of property. I think they let him use this dumpy place for the sole purpose of throwing huge parties, or else they didn't realize that it was being used or something. It was disgusting, filled with beer cans, food wrappers, and college boy posters. Anyways, there were only guys there. I just sat nervously on the couch as they plied me with beer and played pool. Girls started showing up later, but I was hammered at that point. I had never had alcohol before. My date carried me to a room in the back, and though I remember him kissing me, my first kiss, which sucks, I don't remember much else other than refusing to take my jeans off. The next morning, I asked him to drive me home. He said, What? I thought you said you were staying the weekend. I told him I just wanted to go home, but he just laughed and told me he had already made plans that I was staying for a few days and that with what I had told him about my parents... They probably wouldn't even notice. He was pretty much right. I didn't want to seem uncool by freaking out like a baby, so I just shut up the first day. The second day, I pleaded with him to take me home, but he would just laugh and tell me to calm down and stop being so immature. He kept me there for four days total. I was drugged the third night, and I guess you can kind of piece together what happened. He got pissed when I wouldn't stop crying and dropped me off by a field near my house and made me walk home in the dark. When I got home, my parents freaked the hell out at me for running away, but I was too miserable and humiliated to tell them what really happened. They sent me to counseling, but I've never told a soul what really happened those four days. I saw my kidnapper about a year ago at the store, and he smiled and winked at me. Even though it's been like five years, my blood ran cold, and I just flushed and quickly left the store. Story 6. I was 15 and my dad was yelling at and fighting with my mom for the umpteenth time in those few months. I, being the eldest, just ran through the usual protocol. Get all the kids upstairs, put on cartoons at high volume, sit on the stairs and listen. This night wasn't like the others because now he was dragging us kids into his problems. He wanted my mom to go somewhere with him and she refused. He told her he wanted me to come and she said she doesn't want me to go. I got called down and tried to get myself out of it by saying I had exams I wanted to study for, but he was like, no, you can fail. Then he didn't like that nobody was doing everything he wanted, so he called us all down to the living room. He asked, who wants to stay with their mother and who wants to stay with me? Since all we saw was him being abusive and hurting us and mom, the answers he got were either both or mom. He hated that, so he made everyone who said mom go pack their clothes and come back down. He then put us in the car and took our suitcases that we packed, too. Then he took the other kids who said both with him as well, all while mom and him were yelling back and forth and she was begging him to leave us alone. 
We drove off and I had to sit in the front passenger seat next to him. He made me call my mom so he could yell at her that she would never see her kids ever again, etc. At this point, all of us were crying, but none of us would dare to tell him to take us back. Like 15 minutes later, mom called for the millionth time and he told me to pick up and he parked. She was crying and laughing at the same time and told him she couldn't take it anymore and that she was going to die and I guess at that point he snapped out of it maybe. He made a U-turn and went back home and we walked in to find our mom on the floor crying and laughing hysterically. All she could say in between sobs and laughs is, I can't stop, I can't open my eyes. All of us gathered around her, got her water, tried to pick up the pieces, telling her we were here, to open her eyes and look at us. I looked at my dad and said, Dad, what have you done? He just stood there looking on and told me to call my aunt, mom's sister. And I did and told her, something's wrong with mom, can you talk to her? I guess she heard my voice shake and my mom's crying and also started freaking out and crying asking, what's wrong with your mom? At this point, my dad took my phone and ended the call. Then my dad also joined us in trying to snap mom out of it, saying she should stop and she's scaring the kids, that she shouldn't let us see her like this and saying, come on, stop doing that. He was joking and laughing about it, but no one else was. Eventually, mom calmed down like an hour later and he got us to dress her and put her in the car with us and we all went to the original place where he wanted to take her and me at the start. So I guess he got what he wanted. Story 7 When I was 10 years old, there was a kid from school I used to hang out with. We lost touch, but we started hanging out again and he had a new friend. They were both a couple of years older than me. I met the old friend in a school where I skipped a grade and he was left behind. And his new friend was two years older than him and they were both twice my size. One day they asked me to hang out at a new friend's house. I had been there a few times, so I didn't think anything of it. I get there and things just felt off. We were hanging out in his bedroom. They asked me, What's your biggest fear? And I struggled to think of something. Claustrophobia, I said. So they took a blanket and trapped me underneath it for a few minutes while I screamed. I struggled out of it and I said I wanted to go home. They said, we're not going to let that happen. So I looked at the door and I noticed they removed the doorknob from the door. Then I overheard them talking about putting my body in a suitcase. I was like, oh my freaking God, this is about to get bad. So I started mapping out a plan in my mind about how to escape. Since I like to tinker with electronics and machines, I had a pretty decent idea about how physical objects and mechanisms worked. I looked at the nub of the doorknob, had a decent idea of the door's weight, and knew the general plan of the guy's house. I created an escape plan and recited it in my head over and over again until I had it as a single smooth process. My old friend was guarding me while the other guy went into his closet to look for a suitcase to put my body in. Fortunately, he was an idiot and he got into the suitcase itself to see how big it was, and he got stuck in it. He called the other guy to help him get out, so I waited until they were both in the closet, and I made my break for it, executing the plan I practiced in my mind. I raced out of the house and they chased after me, and I ran like hell back to my house. When I got home, my parents just chuckled at me because they were the ones who encouraged me to hang out with those guys in the first place. A few months later, my brother brought the guy who kidnapped me home, and my entire family tormented me together. When I ran into my old friend after college, he apologized to me and told me the other guy ended up going to federal prison for six years for attempted murder. It was cool news to hear that. I still never got treatment for it either. It gave me a lifetime of agoraphobia and fear that I still haven't overcome even in my 30s, especially since that happened because of my parents. My family thought it was hilarious. They still think it's funny. Story 8 I was technically kidnapped for about 30 minutes when I was younger. I was playing at a park in the backyard during a family dinner with my sister, and a younger guy with a dog came up and asked if we wanted to play softball with him. For some reason, we agreed. I was like seven at the time, my sister 10, and he told me that I would need to go to the bathroom before we started and basically forced me into the park bathroom with him and tried to get me to do some questionable and gross things. I basically freaked out and cried and eventually convinced my sister to take me back. The guy was charged with kidnapping and sexual assault and probably other things. Lucky for me, I guess, I've had many concussions and whatnot and have no memory of really anything before sixth grade, so it never really screwed with me emotionally, and I only remember small pieces of what happened. The rest is from the police report. Edit. Just sort of want to clarify that I wasn't assaulted or badly hurt. I felt I shouldn't mention what he did, but I'm not affected by it, so I don't really mind. The guy basically wanted a mouthful of pee.
Story 9. I was 20 years old at the time, waiting for my husband, then boyfriend, outside of our storefront, listening to my iPod. He was a little late from his 9 to 5 job, and it was drizzling, so I stood under the awning against the glass window. The street's okay, just off the main road, so a decent number of cars passed by. A jeep passed me, then reversed and parked a few cars down. A guy, Caucasian, early 40s, slightly overweight, plain and forgettable, gets out and comes up to me and asks me for directions. I tell him I'm not familiar with the area, and he asks if I wanted to sit in his car to wait out the rain. No thanks, I politely decline, but this has my guard up. He starts chatting me up, telling me about his ex, possible victim, who was also Chinese and asked, how old are you? And then acted sad and said things like, I'm too old, I guess, to gauge whether or not I was the type to comfort him and lower my guard because I feel bad about rejecting him. All textbook predator stuff. I had told him at this point that I was waiting for my boyfriend, but every so often when he thought I was softening, he'd ask me to sit in the car with him or said he'll take me to a bar to get something to drink, seeing if I'd be tempted to drink underaged, I guess, while I waited and I noticed him physically trying to edge me towards his car by encroaching on my personal space. It doesn't bother me so I don't move, but I do recognize it as a way to herd me to where he wants me to go. Running was not an option because I didn't wish to turn my back on him. I maintain my back to the glass and I text my boyfriend that some dude is trying to get me into his car and where the heck was he? Not five seconds after I text him, I hear a car screeching around the corner and it's my boyfriend's van. He parks his car in the middle of the street, jumps out and starts running at us and the guy runs to his Jeep and bolts. A few weeks later, we're inside our shop and some guy is outside looking in. I usually invite customers who look interested inside, but this guy declined. He did ask me something that seemed very familiar, but I couldn't put a finger on it. I guess my husband saw my disconcerted face because just as he and the students inside start walking towards me, the guy runs and I suddenly realize it's that same dude. At this point, I should mention that our store is a martial arts school, which apparently did not deter him, although he did ask whether or not I'd be able to mess him up. I didn't want to find out. I wish I could have gotten a license plate number because I'm sure he's done this before, but he would always park just far enough that I can't see it clearly. We purchased a place shortly after and moved so we never ran into him again. Story 10 My story is kind of an in-between. Not really sure if it counts, so I'll keep it as short as I can. Basically, I was living with my mom and her boyfriend of many years, who I am not biologically related to. It was not a stable relationship, but it was a relationship. He does business that requires him to travel a lot, and I know that he has an affinity for Utah. So one day, I think it was a weekend, he said that we were going on a family trip to Utah. I wasn't exactly excited for leaving, and I only got to pack one bag, but was assured with the whole, you'll be outside doing stuff, you won't want to bring this or that. We got on a flight and went to Salt Lake City, where we went to an apartment he had. I remember at one point I got to play with snow, which was one of my first times with it, and I remember peeing into a stream with him. I had no idea anything was amiss. It seemed weird that my mom wasn't with us, but I'm sure he justified it by saying she was coming with me later. I just don't remember it. I remember being pretty damn bored sitting around in his apartment, and I watched a whole lot of MASH, which I wasn't really into. At some point, my mom showed up, and I was taken home, and it was only a number of years later that I was led on to what happened. Nothing changed in their relationship as a result of it, and he wasn't ever charged or anything. It's a kidnapping because he took me without permission. I believe it was due to some kind of argument, but never really escalated to the point that authorities were called, at least as far as I know. Thanks for watching till the end, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more of these ridiculous stories. Love you all, and stay safe out there in that crazy world. Much love. Peace.